Hey everybody, welcome back to Food Chain Wars. Uh, the goal of this show really is to break down e-commerce and digital marketing strategies that ideally help level the playing field and help farm to fork businesses compete with the uh, the corporate food barons that are out there. Um, my name is Brooks Hitsfield, the host of the show, and I'm joined as always by my brother Blaine uh, Hitsfield, CEO of Seven Sons. Blaine, are you ready for another episode? Yes, I am. Cool. Well, can you introduce the topic that we're going to be discussing today? We're actually doing one of our first uh, versus series. So today we're talking retail versus wholesale. So the idea, we're going to do more uh, topics around the, the versus series where we're taking very typical dilemmas like what do you focus your business on retail versus wholesale uh, curbside versus shipping you know retail sales versus online sales take those down break down the pros and cons and share our experience here at seven sons and kind of where we've chosen to focus yeah so this is going to be fun really the goal is to like really give ideally you as a listener a filter to help you pick which direction you want to focus on because historically with the uh, topics that we're going to be breaking down on uh, on this series are going to be things that typically you see businesses focus on one or the other. So for like wholesale versus retail, you know, I'm trying to think of examples of like wholesale businesses out there, Thousand Hill Cattle Company. There's somebody who have definitely focused in the farm to fork world going uh, wholesale, working with retailers, food service type businesses. But then you have people like ButcherBox who obviously you don't see, uh, you know, ButcherBox's product on a grocery store shelf anywhere. So they have focused on the retail side. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go through here, break down some pros and cons. And then I think just for fun at the end, we're going to try to uh, bluff Blaine and I are going to pick our winner for where do we feel like which of these strategies have more opportunity and value for the average listener who's going to be on this episode. Um, but Blaine, before we dig in, uh, let's just do a quick little exercise and lay some ground rules to uh, de- make some definitions. So when we talk about wholesale, retail, those are kind of some loose terms, a lot of different, I think, micro strategies can fit in there. Yeah. Um, maybe just share, like, what's an example for well, us at Seven Sons of wholesale type customers that we work with? And then what are some examples? Yeah, of our dividing customers? line, when we say wholesale, it means we're not selling something to the end consumer. There's someone else involved. Um, and then when we when we say retail, then that's that's a sales channel where we are selling direct to the consumer. So on our farm, the two main forms of retail would be any online sale direct to a consumer or uh, customers that come to our farm store. That's retail for us. And and wholesale would be a distributor that we're selling to. We sell to Whole Foods, uh, food service institutions. The, that's all in my mind. That's all wholesale, regardless if it's a sale to a retailer or not. That's still wholesale for us. Yep, yep. So basically, that's that final distinction: is it being consumed or purchased by the the yeah, end consumer? End consumer, yep. and that breaks it down to retail. Cool. Yep. Well, we're going to do a quick little uh, pros and cons exercise, starting with wholesale first. Um, what are, uh, we're going to go through this and do a pros cons list for wholesale. Then we'll do again, reference and repeat that for uh, retail, but starting with wholesale Blaine and starting with pros, when you think about a da- the average farm to fork business, um, what are some of the opportunities that are out there of, if you do decide to focus on wholesale that you get out of that? Um, well, I think the, the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, wholesale can be great for, um, early stage momentum in your business. I, I feel like if you're just getting started, there's nothing like that boost that a, a, a decent sized wholesale customer uh, can get you. And I can think of several examples for Seven Sons um, because let's face it, as we go into retail, I mean, retail is a slower grow uh, game. It can be more impactful, more profitable, but uh, wholesale in my mind can get you that initial punch in your business to create some economies of scale. So one example would be with, we had a customer that came to us for eggs, uh, a number of years ago, and it was a big enough volume of eggs that I was able to quit my full-time off farm job and finally come back to the farm because again, it was just one account that gave us that boost and some early yeah. stage momentum. No, that makes a lot of sense. We talk about this with uh, people who come to us at Grace Cart uh, often. Um, if they're starting completely from scratch and they're brand new, you know, we try to do a little bit of setting the proper expectation because uh, that can be hard sometimes when you're starting something new. You don't know what you're getting into. Um, you know, and the big thing is, is that when you're starting out, uh, your first, you know, 10 customers are going to be your hardest customers to get. So if you're focusing on retail, at the end of the day, you know, those are end consumers and they're just obviously the purchase potential is just far less than if you get an anchor wholesale yeah. client. So that's why 
early on and early stages of your business, there can be some opportunity there to help you pick up some economies of scale, whether it's on the production side of your business or even the marketing side of your business to just get some some volume moving. Yeah, some of it's just positive energy that that uh, you know keeps keeps it exciting for you. Yeah, another pro I'd mention is uh, especially again when you're starting out, there's a, a brand exposure effect to wholesale. So I have that here too. Yep. Yeah, especially if you focus on like the um, you know retail type wholesale customers where they're going to resell your product in a grocery store shelf. So then it's got your branding on there, which again, that's another important thing to get right in the early days just because of that. And if you do focus on this and, you know, for example, like uh, our eggs that are on a lot of different grocery store shelves, we always think of those, that brand exposure effect as those almost like a, a business card, uh, you know, for our brand. Um, and that can help drive some exposure for a retail arm of your business if that is something that you aspire to grow out. Yeah, I know, Brooks, early on, especially when we were small, we really did feel the effect of some of those early uh, retail outlets that we were in to get that name recognition. We felt it. Uh, You saw people showing up on the website, purchasing online and said, hey, I found out about you through this other, uh, it was actually another home delivery company that we were working with early on. We definitely felt it and it helped. Not only again with that economy of scale, but then translating to name recognition uh, on our own retail side. For sure. You got anything else for pros before we move to cons? Um, I, I do, when I think about wholesale, I think one of the advantages is you can really move some of those higher volume SKUs that maybe you can't sell as much of directly to the retail customer. So I think, I think for seven sons, we sell a lot of ground beef through, uh, some institutions and some other wholesale buyers. So it really does help out with that carcass utilization and balancing your inventory. So we do look strategically at wholesale as an inventory balancing tool to move the entire carcass and not build up uh imbalances of yeah. inventory so yeah at the end of the day having a go-to um i always refer to as a plan b market or plan b outlet for um you know what happens when uh you know managing a full carcass and even if you're doing produce managing you know the harvest it can be tough sometimes um especially when you're talking about frozen meat products and you're trying to plan out inventory way out if you're you know raising animals seasonally um it can be hard to get that right sometimes supply and yeah. demand is tough that's almost like a science um so you're going to get it wrong sometimes so you need some outlets to be able to turn some excess product to. even if it's not the ideal price at least you're turning that that inventory one other uh pro here brooks is it's, this is more with food service um, i do think it's easier sometimes to get started with food service when it comes to a, a, a labeling requirement standpoint uh when you uh, when you go retail, um, you you definitely have some, um, and this is retail going to the, let's say, a, a grocery store. There's a lot of requirements when it comes to labeling from barcoding. We'll talk about this in a bit here. Yep. Um, but food service can be a, a nice win without a whole lot of setup and work. So Cool. All right. Well, well let's go ahead and segue to cons. What do you have uh, for that? Um, you can end up as I just followed up with the, uh, uh, easier to get started with, with food service on the flip side, it also can be difficult, uh, managing the requirements that some of your wholesales will have for fresh packaging and bulk. There's a lot of, for example, Brooks, we don't serve many restaurants because they pretty much only want it uh, fresh and they want deliveries weekly. That can be, uh, pretty challenging on the food service side. Uh, the food service that we do have, Brooks, they, um, the, the two that I'm thinking of, uh, we have to basically package the ground beef in bulk 20-pound bags just for that customer. Yep. So that that's a little bit of a risk and a liability out there, packaging all that just for one customer and keeping it in stock just for them. We don't have any other customer that buys ground beef in 20-pound bulk bags. So yeah. does your processor have those capabilities? Um, you know, yep. A lot of times there's very specific requests that are, outside of maybe your norm. Yeah, so a good way to break this down into a term, I think, is skew complexity. The minute that you start uh, working with uh, food service customers and you work with uh, yeah. you know retail customers, whether you're going wholesale through retail or doing your own retail, um, it definitely adds a, a skew complexity nature because chefs are just going to want certain cuts that um, may not even be, they might even be something that you offer, but they just want to package in a different way for easy handling and the use in, in a food service environment. And that, that might not sound like a, a big deal, but it is a big deal. Some potential consequences that you can run into with this, and I know it's happened to us, is, um, well, like you start saving a cut, you know, for a certain chef and then, yeah. uh, you know, or, or chefs and just that industry uh, as a whole, you know, it's notorious for chefs moving from one restaurant to the other. So you lose your chef. 
um, and that maybe was your main contact there. So then a new guy comes in and they do a menu change or for whatever reason, um, you know, doesn't plan to work with you as a vendor and keep you around. It's basically like you've got to, when you change chefs at a restaurant, we'll say basically you're now you have to win a new customer um, at that point. Um, So if you do lose them then, and if you were saving something specifically to them, that was only an outlet for them. uh, Well, now you've got to go scrambling around for another outlet for that before you run into, you know, perishability issues or quality issues with it I, i'm thinking of one customer in particular uh brooks was ordering this cut called beef banana heel <laughs> um, it's not a very uh good sounding cut from a retail side of things but we had hundreds and hundreds of pounds if not thousands of pounds of banana heel saved up for this customer and then they dropped off the face of the earth and we had a bunch of banana heel selling in freezer. yeah to our customers that, yeah. that's always a that was a fun question it, it became to... the popular faq on the website <laughs> what is banana heel <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, what else do you, you have for potential downsides? Um, well, you know, there's only two sides of the coins, downsides for uh, when it comes to working with wholesale customers. Yeah, so in addition to that packaging complexity, um, uh, I would also say if you're selling wholesale to, say, a grocery store, so a retail setting, um, if you're talking about a, a retail grocery store chain, the amount of labeling requirements from barcoding to your claims, um, you know, just your branding in general, nutritional facts, uh, that can be daunting. Um, and, and a lot of times a retailer will want you to have some third-party uh, audits. Like for example, with our eggs and whole foods, we have the non-GMO project verified. That's expensive. It costs thousands of dollars per year. So I would say that's a con when you're looking at uh, going wholesale to a retail chain or outlet. It, it, there can be some real barriers from a technical labeling standpoint. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And this almost plays into the philosophical side of it, um, you know, because it's just the way it is when you're when a product is sitting on a grocery store shelf, uh, you know, the retailer, they need more information to be able to help communicate and transfer trust to the customer. So yeah. that's where those certifications and label claims uh, really come into play. And, um, you know, I know definitely with the retailers we worked with, like Whole Foods, um, you know, there's definitely requirements that, and those requirements can change and can on you. So you might be in the door and now suddenly you're, it's part of ongoing costs where you've got to keep up to date with now whatever they're requiring for your type of product um, that you have on the shelf. Yeah, and like for Whole Foods, they require or they ask you to run a, a promotion and a sale every quarter. So every three months. So we have to build that into our cost. And yeah. um, so that's one thing that you, you mentioned, the philosophical side of this. It's frustrating when going retail, you can get so much cost wrapped up in the complexity of the branding the labeling, the audits, that there's not a whole lot of margin left for going the extra mile to produce a better product. And that's what's frustrating. It's a very poor, what do you want to say, value translation by the time you jump through all those hoops. Sometimes you have to get a broker involved, a distributor involved. There's just not much left uh, as far as real tangible value improvement for the customer through those chains. But it is, there is an opportunity there and we have captured that opportunity for sure with our eggs through Whole Foods. So another thing I would put on a cons list here when it comes to, and it's, it's more general and for sure this isn't going, I'm generalizing. So this isn't the case with every wholesale customer that you work with, but uh, cash management is also, um, I think a downside um, when it comes to accounts payable, anyone who's really focused on wholesale, especially if you don't have a lot of systems in place for managing your accounts payable and a collections process that can get out of control very, very quickly. We've had some Um, nightmares. Yes. Yep. For sure. And I've heard other folks who've ran into those situations as well. You know, obviously, if you do really focus and scale out this as part of your business, um, eventually you see anyone who's doing this at scale, they get very organized uh, with this process to where there's a credit application to where if anyone wants to pay, uh, you know, via credit and get some terms, you've got to apply for that. And, uh, you know, all that structure is really just to create some filters and accountability to make sure that you don't end up product out the door without cash coming back in or cash just coming in late. And all of a sudden now you're financing, um, you know, product that's been delivered. Um, so definitely a tricky situation when you contrast that to direct to consumer retail, like with what we're doing, Blaine, everyone who goes to the website, they put in their credit card and they're paying pretty much real time yeah. as they're buying the products. So we're getting the cash up front. 
before the customer even has it's, it delivered to their home versus you flip that around where a lot of these major retailers you're going to work with are they're asking for net 30 and sometimes net 45 and beyond you know, payment terms. Um, yeah. So that's a big difference when you start thinking about, it might not seem like a big deal when you're small, but as you start to grow and scale out, it really it's, adds up. Um, it's a double it win, higher margin and cash before the product even leaves. So risk mitigation uh, and much better for cash. Well, and it's a big deal if you're doing production as well, because you got to think you've already had cash into raising beef animals for how long? And now like, like after you've delivered the final product and all the additional costs that go into that logistics, customer service, um, and you still don't get the cash back for another 45 or 30 days. Um, it, it, there is a cost to all of that um, delayed uh, cash side of things. And you just need to be aware of it as you get into it. So seven sons over the years has migrated from, you know, we used to be a little more desperate for the sales brook. So we had a net 45 at one time days for payments. Yep. We backed that to 30 and now we're at 15 and we are strict about that 15. We have two of our very best wholesale customers, Brooks. It's common for us to send them an email and say, we have to hold this product at our facility until we get a payment. Yeah. And it, you just have to do that. You've got to be prepared for that um, upfront getting into this. Cause if you're not willing to be that person uh, to send that email, it doesn't, um, it doesn't have to be rude. It's just no. simply matter of fact. Yeah, uh -huh, and the way it works. Um, and you have to be willing to do that or else you will get burnt um, at some point. It's just a matter of time. Matter, so. matter of time. Before we move into uh, retail, I, I thought a fun question would be asked. Do you have any like experiences? I know you've talked about a few examples, but of uh, best and worst wholesale uh, customer experiences uh, and maybe the worst side. Uh, yeah, for sure. This is oh man, it's probably eight years ago. Um, but I think back to a restaurant that was buying uh, actually halves of beef that we were delivering to the back door of the restaurant. They were, they were actually processing it. Uh, it was pretty cool. They were processing it there in the restaurant. They had a large kitchen where they could do some processing, but they were moving a lot of volume and they missed a few payments, and before you know it, we had made three deliveries, no payment, and we were, I think they were into us for $45,000. We ended up getting that down to like 18000 and the, again, back to what you're saying, the chef moved yeah. on. The owners were like, ah, we're not we're not that concerned about paying uh, this producer. Right, and at that time, our business was a lot smaller, so it was a big deal, but luckily, uh, you know, we weren't small enough to where that was, um, you know, something that really set the business back and yeah. could be catastrophic, which if you are just starting out, those are situations that you can, you can get into. Yeah, I wanted to mention, Brooks, uh, because uh, wholesale can be a trickier to kind of get in the door. There's, the, you know, the gatekeepers you gotta get through, the buyers. I wanted to mention some backdoor strategies that we've found um, over the years. And one would be, uh, and this is, you know, this is obvious, but it's just a reminder, the best time to get into a, a wholesale customer is when they have a supply gap, when they have a disruption in their supply and you have to be ready to jump on those. I mean, I'm thinking uh, several of our uh, large wholesale customers, Brooks, that we have today uh, came to us through, because they had a supply disruption and then we were able to slip in there right at the right time we were ready react to do it fast, yep. react fast, and then we maintain consistency. And that has been a backdoor strategy for us being ready. But you have to, I mean, you have to be aggressive. I know when one of our wholesale customers came to us for eggs a number of years ago, uh, we didn't have the eggs they were asking for. But within two weeks, we, we scoured the entire country, called every hatchery, and we found 700 hens. We drove out to Hershey, Pennsylvania, picked them up, brought them back, and we were you know, we were ready to supply that customer within weeks. You yeah. Know, you have to be aggressive. And that's the thing you can't get discouraged when, when people focus on this strategy, they'll reach out to a bunch of buyers and you get rejection after rejection after rejection. Well, it's because, you know, grocery store shelves, they're full, you know, they're not missing slots often. So really your goal needs to be to make as many introductions as you can. Yeah. And eventually there'll be a supply gap and they'll reach back out to you. You just want to stay relevant and you want to help make sure that they remember you when they do have that supply gap. Yeah. Another backdoor strategy would be a uh, distributor. Sometimes a uh, distributor has the relationships with the gatekeepers and they actually have trucks and they can put wheels on your boxes. And that can be a good backdoor strategy, even long-term uh, that's how it worked for us with eggs, Brooks. Uh, one distributor out of Indianapolis got us into our first two Whole Foods. The second distributor got us into like eight Whole Foods in Chicago. And after three years, we finally developed a relationship with Whole Foods to the point where they brought us on for the entire region. But it all started actually with the relationship that a couple of you know, smaller local distributors had. So that was that's another backdoor strategy. Um uh, I would say, Brooks, another one would be finding uh, companies that may have a local food initiative or requirement for their chefs or buyers. So we actually have two accounts like this where the, the, the company, the food service company themselves 
has a requirement that a certain percentage of the food has to be purchased locally. Yep. So that has been a big win for us to find those. Um, and you mentioned the other one too, Brooks, just developing relationships with chefs as they move around. Uh, you know, there's the relationship is there and you're just in the door because the chef moved on to a different restaurant. And sometimes you can maintain uh, connections at both restaurants, the former yeah. restaurant and yep. the new one they're moving to. Yeah, so. there's two sides of that. You might get into the new account for your existing chef where they went into. Um, and then again, um, on the flip side of that, you got to make sure you make that relationship with the new chef coming in who's replacing. Cool. Well, yeah. let's go ahead and transition into uh, retail pros and cons. Start with the pros. Well, for sure, it's, uh, I mean, the obvious one is, is higher margin. So just, just to, as a reference point for those listening, when we go wholesale, uh, we are typically around that 25 to 28% margin. Again, not markup, but margin. It's taken a long time across the board to get our wholesale margin up that high. We had a lot of accounts, even as low as uh, 10 and 15% margin, Brooks, for, mm-hmm. for a while. So we've really done some work. We've purged some wholesale customers. But we finally got that up to 25 to 28% margin. Uh, but with a retail, depending on how you figure it, we're closer to a 35 to 45% margin. Um, I do know that uh, after delivery and all costs cleared, we're closer to that 40% margin when we sell uh, through e-commerce, Brooks. Yep, so. yep, yep. Yep, higher big, margins. Big, big difference, especially when you consider the cash flow. So. Yep, yep, yep. And I think this is why everyone uh, or a lot of people will even aspire to go retail for the first place here. And, I mean, the topic and name of the show, uh, you're climbing the food chain to the very top the minute that you have that end customer. Yeah, it's it's really kind of the holy holy grail. The other thing that I like about uh, retail, Brooks, is just the security involved with owning that customer relationship with the end consumer. Um, you can tell your story you're uh, you're actually dealing with the decision maker and your risk is spread out. I, I think about the amount of sales that we have through our top five wholesale customers, Brooks, then the amount of sales we have spread across 10,000 active uh, e-commerce customers. That feels a lot more uh, secure and, uh, and it's actually more rewarding as well. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. You want to be careful that... Uh and it's the whole eggs in your, you know, all in one yeah. basket. And you're, if you're at the point where like you are concerned and you would have to make some really major changes on the production side of your business, if you lost an anchor wholesale account, you, you do have to consider about what is that value of diversifying. Yeah. Yep, exactly. I kind of like the fact too, Brooks, we've really, I think with retail, we've had more opportunities to, uh, to innovate and, uh, you know, just innovate on adoption. We just have more control over the, the buying experience to differentiate ourselves from the competition. So we do that. A lot of the, the technology approach with Grayscart has helped us do that. Uh, I'm just thinking of subscribe and save and that buyer experience. We're able to be, uh, we're really able to set ourselves apart uh, with the buying experience where you just don't, you don't have that opportunity with wholesale. Yeah, you know, you can kind of combine your last two things that you mentioned together into one uh, with the strategy that we had uh, with launching Fresh Egg Co. Um, you know, you have the cartons over there, but basically that yeah. was a whole brand where where it's at today. It's very new for us, and it's still time will tell. The verdict is out um, on um, you know how this will all turn out for us, but it's gotten its initial leg up. Uh, because of the fact that, you know, Seven Sons is focused on direct consumer. We have an email list of, you know, tens and tens of thousands of uh, subscribers that we can reach out to. There's no gatekeeper in between that. We can do whatever we want when it comes to diversifying and trying something new. And there's people there, a list of potential waiting customers. And when you look at online businesses as a whole, which is important to think about um, if this is where you're trying to focus, um, you know, during an acquisition, uh, you know, people will look at the buyer will look at your email list and the health of your email list as an asset for the business. It's a it's a virtual, non tangible asset um, that um, you know brings up valuations for a lot of different brands um, who go down that strategy or that path. Yep, yep. The other thing too, Brooks, is uh, you know, with retail going direct to the consumer, especially online, for us, um, it's it's been something that. Once we've been established, it's it's much more scalable for us, um, and can uh, can really start a snowball effect of growth. So it's it's one of my first cons with retail is that it's slow going to get started. I mean, it's it, you're in it for the long haul when long haul when you're going retail, but once you get some inertia behind you. Uh, Brooks, we're, we're doing things with lookalike audiences on Facebook. And the only reason we can do that is because it's a lookalike audience. We're looking at our, our current 10,000 customers, active customers, and we're saying, hey, Facebook, go find more people like these. So there's just, yeah. there's some real 
little snowball strategies that can happen once you finally get through that startup phase. Uh, and word of mouth becomes uh, can be very, very viral. At, and, and so it can really help uh, grow your retail side of it. Yeah, yeah. No, you and I were talking about this the other day, and we kind of had to laugh about it because if you, you know, if you're new and you're starting out, and you turn to I don't know someone in your area who is uh, direct marketing and they've gained some scale, and ask them, you know, what's uh, you know, what are the top strategies and how they're getting customers? You know, oftentimes you'll hear the answer. I know I've classically heard it many times. Is well, word of mouth. That's where we get our customers. You know, they just, you know, yep. that's the biggest. That's the biggest thing when it comes to marketing. Have good customer service and and, and word of mouth. Which is true, but it does not do anything to help you when you're starting out from scratch. And it is a beautiful thing, but um, you do have to get that initial velocity off the ground. You talked about it being slow, and it is slow. Your first 10 customers, first 100 customers are your hardest customers to get. But once you have 100 there and you are providing them a good experience, that's when you get that the magical uh, benefit of things just compound effect of uh, more customers coming in the door without you having to do a whole lot of work. Yeah, and for us, it's been really helpful to help cash flow, cash flow the growth of the business, Brooks, with that retail margin and that better uh, upfront payment has really been helpful as we've uh, hit some growing pains. Uh, it would be much more difficult to do that with that lower margin and a slower cash turnaround of, of wholesale. Yep. Nope. Makes sense. Um, I mean, I think we've hit on some of the, the top ones. Do you have anything else you want to slide in before we move to uh, cons? No, we can go to the cons. It's not all perfect, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, flip side of that, and this is always, I mean, I almost feel like this, this side of it is tough for you and I, because obviously this is a big part of the show and what we talk about a lot is going direct consumer, but yeah. everything does have uh, a negative side of the coin. So uh, what do you have for cons? Well, you have to the biggest thing is is it's slow to get started as we were just talking about and you uh, as i mentioned you've got to be committed and be in this for the long haul it it disheartens me brooks when i see a grace cart client that says you know i've given this my full effort for the last 12 months and it's just not working and and the the tough love is that 12 months is just getting started. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to be prepared to pace yourself, to structure your business and cash flow. Don't go quitting your full-time job if you have an off-farm job or, uh, or whatever. Uh, don't paint yourself into a timeline corner when you're trying to make retail your anchor category. Now, if it's just an add-on sales channel to a wholesale business, that's very different. Uh, you can kind yeah. of sustain that for a while. But I hate to see someone... Uh, with the wrong expectations within 12 months, this is going to be cash flow in itself. I'm going to be in a good place. It, it takes longer than that. Yeah. No, Brent and I, uh, who helps out <clears throat> sharing um, um, a grace cart with people who are interested in going direct to consumer. And we hear from a lot of people who are just starting out. And, um, it, you know, it's we talk about how it's like one of the least favorite parts of our job, but it is a very important part is expectation management because so many times people will get into this. I, I would say, and we get the question a lot too of what's the number one reason or difference between someone who makes it um, with Grace Cart and direct to consumer this whole farm fork thing and someone who doesn't because you know providing the software we do to hundreds of farms across the country, we kind of actually do have that behind the curtain lens to start to see trends there. And the biggest difference at the end of the day, when you're talking about people who are starting from scratch is definitely the, the expectation and um, even just the resilience factor that someone has to get into it. It's going to be a little different than you thought, but uh, and actually it could be a lot different than you thought, but do you have the tenacity to stick it through, get through year one, yes. um, not be able to go full time, like maybe it was your initial goal and just keep going. Um, Re relentless. Yes. I, I like the term relentless is what you have to be with starting a retail business and rem reminding yourself that uh, there is a lot of value to be captured when you go to their retail customer and uh, nobody's just giving away free retail customers. Yeah. You, you have to earn those. You have to go steal them. You have to convince them. Or I like the term, catch them when they're looking for something different. Yep. You want to position yourself to be found as somebody saying, and I don't know if I trust this from the grocery yeah. store. Let me do a Google search. Let yeah. me. And it's unfortunate because I think, you know, as farmers, we fall prey to this uh, expectation issue so often because you see people who are going direct to consumer and you it see where easy. the world's moving. It's like, oh yeah, all I do is I get this website and then it's just going, you know, the, it just works, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, you know, sometimes we'll hear from people who are like, uh, yeah, uh, you know, want to go direct consumer, feel like I need a website to sell online. I've got some animals that are heading into processing in the next two months here, 30 head. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we need to sell them. And it's like, 
uh, you don't have a website, you don't have an email list, like you don't have any potential awareness for potential customers who might be interested in these outside of friends and family. And you know, those are the, the really not fun calls because uh, at the end of the day, you really need to be marketing. We always say, if you can start marketing a year in advance, um, yeah. and that yeah. goes, goes to show the point of the con side of this. It is a slower grow, but higher rewards. Yep. Yeah, a big thing, a tip here, Brooks, I'll throw on with this grueling startup phase is have a support network. I think that's one of the biggest values propositions or one of the bigger value propositions that we bring with the Gray's cart community is just that uh, that support network yeah, that's yeah. there. Yeah, if you want a shortcut, you know, there's only a couple ways to do it and it's like, well, you need to know what you know or and you know who don't you, what you don't know um yeah. i messed that up a little bit yeah, but no. basically the whole idea is you need to go find people who've got answers and can help get you up to speed for what are the strategies that you need to focus on um you know who are the contacts that you need to have um and then you know you've got to work to get that visibility as fast as possible so an investment into that of hiring people who can help you with facebook advertising those different types of things to get your brand in front of people um so the investment that's probably the biggest things to get things moving yeah. faster and yeah. knowledge and uh, expertise learn 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 especially from those that have gone uh, before you so uh brooks another con and i i'm when i when i talk about this one i'm more referring to maybe some some farms that are just making the transition or thinking about making the transition to direct marketing uh, but when you go retail you are working direct with the public uh so you need to ask yourself can you embrace this are you willing to embrace this are you are you cool with putting yourself out there with all your of your marketing? Uh, we always remind ourselves, and, and I've I think it was Jeff Walker that I first heard this from. But you know, people don't want to buy from just a, a faceless brand or business. They want to buy from, and especially food, as something as intimate as food. They want to buy from people they can know, like, and trust. And, yep. and you have to build that relationship. So kind of have to have the temperament for it, Brooks. I yep. mean, you're willing to, to have an open door policy for your farm. I mean, that's a, that's a big commitment. Yep. Uh, just last Friday, Brooks, we had a customer that dropped in from, from Chicago, a very good customer. And we dropped everything and uh, we gave them a tour, a personal tour. They they made a point to emails, told us they were coming out. And we do those types of things. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot of reward. Um, even from the monetary side and security side that we just went through when it comes to climbing the top of the, the food chain. Um, but yeah, there's work that goes into it and cost that goes into it. It doesn't all come out. There is higher margins, but it's not all pure yeah. margins when you contrast, um, you know, what your, your price could be going to the sale bar and going wholesale instead. And it's hard that you'll get contacted by the phone or email and you'll have customers asking, you know, very probing questions that, that can come, sometimes be a little bit, uh, you know, offensive, but we've come to really embrace, we want Want that customer who's who wants to probe, wants to get answers. That customer that says, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily trust uh, the grocery store organic products anymore. I yeah. have more questions that I want answers to. And a lot of times they show up to farms like us, Brooks, and they're a little bit uh, ticked off and frustrated because they've been duped by some label that they learned about. And so they're, they're not ready to just trust immediately. They have questions and we really want to embrace that customer. Yeah. Sometimes those are hard customers to get, but also what we love about it is they're, they're hard customers to lose. Cause once you do lock in that trust, obviously if it was hard to get, then, um, you know, the next competitor out there, it's going to be tough for them to, uh, to steal that customer. Yeah. Yep. Uh, another con here, Brooks, but it's just an opportunity. But uh, retail definitely requires some very specific skill sets, especially if you're looking to go e-commerce. I'm thinking, you know, email marketing's involved, some social media marketing, website design, content production, whether you're, you know, it's written content, video content, uh, photography content. You really kind of need to build yourself a little bit of an ecosystem of helpers that are good at these things and they can help you out. And, and you have to be okay with engaging in this aspect of your business. Yeah. Um, it's high value stuff to engage in, but it takes a, some time There's and effort up front. Yeah. You contrast the uh, $10 million business that focused on wholesale uh, versus a $10 million business that focused on retail. And you will notice uh, there's major differences when it comes into looking at their P&L, the overheads that go into it, people uh, the involved. HR, yeah, number of number of people that are involved. There's going to be a big difference there. There's reason for it. And it does turn out to be uh, net more margin, but 
it's net more effort. Um, that, uh, so, along so another that. difference, Brooks, that we look at when we when we are looking at uh, Grace Cart clients and other farms that are succeeding at the retail side of direct marketing, either the founder or the owner has a keen interest in these the nuances of marketing, or they have someone on their team that does. Brooks, uh, yep. nowhere do we find somebody that just really didn't have a knack for it, no interest in this in these skills. Uh, but somehow they magically succeeded with uh, building a substantial retail market. Uh, you really don't find that. Yep. Yep. Makes a lot of sense. Cool. Well, let's go ahead and wrap up with, uh, you know, you and I just sharing um, really it's advice and we've kind of done that with the episode on, you know, for our listeners um, and maybe for somebody, I mean, just general, I guess, advice for the different stages. Where would you talk to someone today? Um, you know, tell them to focus if they were asking the question, because there is value in focus. Too. Well, yeah, again, realize that if you're pursuing retail, you're going to have to do some unscalable things to get started. Some farmers markets, they're painful, but you get that initial customer base. Again, you mentioned those first 100 customers come very hard and usually they come through unscalable uh, methods or yep. tactics until you can develop scalable uh, methods and tactics. Uh, so just recognize that. The other thing you mentioned early on, Brooks, is uh, rarely do you find a, a business in our sector that's doing wholesale and e-commerce or retail really well at equal scale. Generally, you move towards one or the other, and you should. So you need yeah. to stay in your lane. One one approach that we've taken, Brooks, is we've definitely went down the focus on retail and e-commerce. But our wholesale, we did not forget about our wholesale strategy. It's more of an integrated strategy. So we love the wholesale customer that gives us exposure for our brand. Yep. We love the wholesale customer that is actually another online home delivery company because that fits the products we have, the specs we have, the labeling, the SKU set, the just the content we have around our brand really works well for those other wholesale yeah. customers. Yeah. You know, I think it's obvious, of course, you and I, we're going to swing for retail and uh, direct consumer marketing for all the pros that we mentioned there. But I think it is important to assess uh, what stage you're at. Um, like you were just saying, and again, if you're starting from scratch, it, it's just, it's part of it. You got to put in that sweat equity, right? And you yeah. got to take revenue wherever you can get it. Uh, to get the benefits of the economies of scale. Um, but at the same time, while you're doing those unscalable activities, um, make sure you have a vision. I think that's really important to have and gets people in a lot of trouble if you don't have it mapped out in your mind of where do you want your business? Like what what is the holy grail for you of what you'd want your business to look like in five years and which one of these channels are you gonna plan to focus on? Because there's a lot of things that will, you'll be making a lot of decisions from day one with who's gonna be your processing partner. Um, you know, and those types of relationships um, that can set you up ahead to be, make a quicker pivot when you do decide and have that opportunity to focus on the scalable activities on either one of these lenses of the, of the sales channels, uh, retail or wholesale. Good points. All right. Any final thoughts before we wrap up? Those are my final, final thoughts. Uh, find your lane and stick to it. Uh, don't give up. Cool. All right. Well, um, you know, I will just probably leave you with that. You know, if you do have one of these strategies that you plan to focus on and you're new into your direct marketing journey, um, you know, uh, seek advice, uh, try to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, find mentors or people in your area who have focus on the channel that you're on and uh, just accelerate things by asking uh, questions and digging under the curtain behind their business to try to get ahead and get to where you want to go and, and really develop that channel for yourself faster. So uh, if you enjoyed the episode, uh, we you know, break down, there'll be other uh, uh, categories like this, this whole versus back and forth. This was our first one. I enjoyed it. Yep. Um, it's a good format. Um, but we also interview uh, you know experts from the industry to break down different tactics to, again, help you climb that food chain. So be sure to subscribe and we'll catch you guys next time.